So thus far in our analysis of sound, we talked a little bit about um, the standing wave effect with sound, and we said uh, that you had a similar wavelength relationship to um, standing waves on a string, except it depended on whether the tube was open, open, closed, closed, or closed, open. And then uh, we developed um, intensity and um, sound level relationships to, in our discussion of the loudness of sound. And we said that loudness was related to the amplitude of air molecule motion, how much the air molecules are vibrating back and forth in the longitudinal wave, excuse me. And <clears throat> that amplitude of air molecule motion affected the loudness, it affected the intensity, it affected the pressure variation in the wave. Intensity was defined as the ratio of a power, that's a power, not a pressure, to an area which for a point source was 4 pi, 4 pi r squared of surface area <clears throat> over which the sound energy spreads. And then lastly, we defined the logarithmic scale for intensity known as the decibel scale because intensity varied over a large numbers of powers of 10. Taking the logarithm just brings it down to nice human-sized numbers. So 10 decibels is about the lowest sound you can hear. And when you get up to 100, it starts to get painful. So that's where we've been so far. Um, we're going to introduce, discuss a few other sound effects today. Uh, the first is the Doppler effect. And if you've ever listened to, um, if you've ever attended, um, you know, Formula One or NASCAR races, you will have heard this effect because as the car approaches you, it goes, nee! then as the car goes past you, it goes, Whoa. and if you listen carefully to that, there's a couple of things that are happening. First of all, nee! the intensity or loudness of the sound increases as the car gets close to you and then decreases as it goes further away. But the other thing that happens is as the car is approaching, it's going nee. as the car is going away from you, it's going Whoa. there's a change in pitch. You hear a high pitch or a high frequency as the car approaches you. You hear a low pitch as the car moves away from you. And the shift in frequency is proportional to how quickly things are moving. So that's why we notice it with racing cars, but we don't notice it, say, with our friends as we're walking, as they walk towards us, say, in the library or something like that. So <clears throat> we want to um, describe this mathematically. Now, it actually turns out it doesn't matter what's moving, the observer or the source. Any towards motion gives you a high pitch. Observer towards source or source towards observer. So if you could run really fast towards a stationary racing car, the sound from the engine would be Doppler shifted. Any away motion also gives you lower pitch. We could just draw a simple diagram and understand where the Doppler effect comes from. It would be helpful if you had three colors here. So the source starts here, S is source, O is observer over here, and it emits a sound wave. Now, a little bit later, that sound wave will have traveled a certain distance in space, It'll have traveled away from where the vibration started, which was this point in space here. And a little later, it's traveled even further. The sound speed in air is 331 plus 0.6 times temperature. So it's going pretty quickly. You know, 330, 340 meters per second at typical air temperatures. And so that just shows a snapshot of that sound wave spreading away from the source <clears throat> as time goes on. But of course, the source is not stationary. So while the blue sound wave is spreading away from the blue point, the source has moved over here to the red point. The colors are just representative. So while the blue wave has spread this far, the sound wave that was emitted, the vibration that started in the air at the red point, hasn't traveled as far. But it's moving away from the point where the vibration in the air started, which is that red dot right there. Now we'll switch colors again, because of course, while the red sound wave and the blue sound wave are spreading, through space, are spreading through space, the source is again moved over, and it's going to emit a sound wave centered on this green point. And these are spherical wave fronts spreading out through space. So what we notice right away is that <clears throat> the sound waves are bunching up here, and they're spreading out here. So with... Um, a shorter wavelength, a shorter distance between them because um, of the wave equation, 
wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. So these waves are closer together, that's a shorter wavelength, that will be a higher frequency. And if the observer happened to be over here, they would see a larger wavelength and <clears throat> therefore a lower frequency. So as the source moves towards you, you will inevitably hear a higher pitch. We've just proven it using a simple geometric argument. Now, this argument that we've made can be used to come up with an expression for the Doppler effect. So <clears throat> we, the sound wave, we'll use V for the speed of sound, in a time t will travel that distance. The source, and I'll use v of source, will travel a little bit of distance as well. So the distance between wave fronts you can see, so this distance here, say, is vt. This distance here is v source t. So this distance here, the distance between the wave fronts right here, is just the difference between those two distances we just calculated. This one is larger, so we subtract like that. Now, <clears throat> that's actually the wavelength that's observed. So I'll put a little dash there for observed. And um, if we want to find the observed frequency, well, we just saw that that's V over the observed wavelength. So that's V over this expression. And I'll just factor out a T because I'm planning ahead. So I get this ratio of speeds times 1 over T. But 1 over t, that is the actual frequency of the vibration. So there's two uh, frequencies here. There's the one that's observed, and I'll just use a dash for the observed one. And there's the actual frequency of the engine. And then there is a ratio of speeds. So we have shown that when the source moves towards the detector, there's a relationship here between the observed and actual frequencies. You could do it the same derivation for the source moving away, and you would just find a plus in the denominator. <clears throat> Let's now look at a moving observer. So here's the observer moving, and here's the source of sound at rest, and the sound waves moving in this direction here. So this is the speed of sound, this is the speed of the observer. So the observer goes a distance, VOT, and the sound goes a distance, VT. So the observer is going to cross or encounter a number of waves. So the <laughs> distance that's traveled, well, you see the observer is going to reach this point here, and these sound waves are going to reach that same point. So the observer is going to pass all of these sound waves in time t. So those two distances add together, and then we divide by the actual wavelength. So that number of waves will pass the observer in time t. And frequency, of course, is just the number of waves, the cycles of wave per second. So we take this and we divide by time. So we've got uh, 1 over time times v naught plus v. And let's factor out the time. Oh, look, it's just going to cancel anyway. So this is the observed frequency, and we were calling that f prime. Now we see we end up with reciprocal wavelength. And we saw earlier that the reciprocal wavelength is just f over v. So because lambda f is lambda f is the speed of sound, I can replace um, lambda with v over f. But I don't really have lambda. I've got reciprocal lambda because it's in the denominator. So that's f over v. So I'm going to rewrite this expression now as f over v. And so I see that for towards motion of an observer, the observer term ends up in the numerator. So in general, so observer moving towards the source, here's the relationship right here. There's the observed and actual frequencies, there's the speed of the observer, and V stands for the speed of sound. So that was towards motion, away motion would give a negative. So in general, um, you're going to have an expression like this, because you could have both the moving source and a moving observer moving relative to the assumed stationary air. So this is the observed, this is the actual, and we have a little bit of a logical uh, challenge in assigning um, the positives or negatives. There's a fairly simple logical argument that enables us to do that in general, and <clears throat> it just relies on our understanding of fractions. So 
let's demonstrate a few times here. So here we've got the engine of a race car emitting sound. So this is the actual frequency of the engine. And then the lead car in the race, so this is the source, is moving at 55 meters per second. And then uh, we have a spectator at rest in front of the car, so there's our observer. And we're just wondering what frequency they hear, given that the speed of sound V is given, 340. So we know that the observed frequency is the actual frequency, and then there's a ratio that depends on observer motion in the numerator and source motion in the denominator. So <clears throat> now, first of all, we're lucky in this case because the observer is at rest, so we don't need to worry about that term. So it remains to decide whether this is plus or minus. Now, you can either memorize it or you can apply the following reasoning. So just ask yourself, do we have towards or away motion here? And the source is moving towards the observer. So that's towards motion. Towards motion always yields higher pitch. So if this is going to be bigger than this is, what operation do we have here? Well, because this is down in the denominator, we're going to subtract because that makes a smaller denominator and therefore a bigger fraction and a bigger observed frequency. So thus, we'll just write it again for clarity, this is the correct Doppler effect ratio to use in this case. The actual frequency of emitted by the engine is 550, the speed of sound is 340, and we subtract the 55 meters per second of the car's engine. And we can just work that out quickly. And we get 656 hertz is the observed. That was 656, wasn't it? Yes, it was 656. So that's what would be registered by the observer. Another example, so here again is our source. It's still the same racing car, but now we have an observer at rest behind the car. So we go through the reasoning once again. Observer term, numerator, source term in the denominator. Now, this source is moving away from the observer. That always yields lower pitch. So this is to be a smaller answer. <clears throat> the observer is again at rest, so that just disappears. Now, in order for the answer to be smaller, in the denominator we're going to add, because that will yield a bigger denominator, a smaller fraction, and a smaller observed frequency. So write it again just for clarity. It's the same engine, the same speed of sound, and the same observed speed, or say the same speed of source. One more try here. Now let's deal with both of them in motion. <clears throat> so here we have, this is the source, okay? It's still the same racing car engine with the same emitted actual frequency of 550 hertz. <clears throat> here though, now let's find out what this observer in this other car would hear. So now we're going to have both terms, observer motion and source motion. All right, so let's start with the source. Which way is the source moving? Well, this arrow is pointed away from the observer. Away motion always yields lower pitch because the source term appears in the denominator. If we want this answer to be smaller, we should have addition here. Now for the first time, we need to consider observer motion. Which way is this vector pointed? Well, it's pointed towards the source, not away, but towards. Towards motion, we know, always yields higher pitch. So if you want this to be a bigger answer, well, now because we're in the numerator, we should add to get a bigger answer. In the numerator, we're going to add. And so this is the correct Doppler effect ratio for this case. So it's 550 hertz, 340 sound speed, plus 50 meters per second of observer speed, over 340 plus 55 of source speed. <clears throat> now, we are Doppler shifting <clears throat> relative to the stationary air. That means we need to consider both the source motion and the observer motion to get the most accurate answer. So <clears throat> that's a look at the Doppler effect and at some of the logic of setting up these equations. We'll practice that a bit more in class. The next effect that we'll consider 
is beats. And we're going to show in class what beats are, but it's an interference effect. It doesn't sound that pleasant. It's an increase and decrease in intensity, a wow, that's just proportional to the difference between two frequencies. And <clears throat> we are going to add two traveling wave equations using this same identity that we used before. We'll ignore the kx part of the term and just focus on the omega t part of the, um, of the term. And so adding those together, so this will be like our first one, and then this will be our second one, and then we'll apply the identity, and it says add them and divide by 2, and subtract them and divide by 2. Now, <clears throat> it's helpful um, to again consider this as two terms. This is going to be a relatively small frequency because these two, if they're close together, when you subtract them, you get something very small. So that's a small frequency, like an envelope function, like we had for a standing wave. This is going to be a much larger frequency. And so that's changing a lot more quickly. And we'll, we'll just call that a vibration. Now we're going to show in class that when you add these two terms together, you will inevitably get a graph somewhat like this. So here it is recopied. So this is the small frequency, and it would be helpful to use two colors at this point. This is the envelope function. It's a small frequency because we've subtracted two things. And so here we'll draw an envelope sort of like that. And now this is a high-frequency vibration. And so that is just going up and down and up and down and up and down like that. But you see that up and down and up and down and up and down at some points drops off to zero. And where it drops off to zero, that is the beats. That's where the sound disappears and we get no intensity. <clears throat> Now, a little task for you is to just try graphing this on your graphing calculator and just show that it happens any time you add cosine functions that are really close together. So just add cosine 100x and cosine 101x. And if, if you graph it on the right window, you should see... Well, that's not very good. Oh, I've got a mess. You should see exactly what we were just driving and drawing on the other page. So you should see, adding those two cosine curves together, you get exactly this sort of effect with beats because you've added two cosines that have really close but slightly different frequencies. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> this is just a natural occurrence when you're adding two things with slightly different but very close together frequencies. So you have an intensity that increases and decreases and occasionally vanishes. Now we count a beat every time, oh it's on the next slide, sorry, every time the envelope function goes to zero. So there's a beat there and a beat there. That means there's two for every cycle. So our envelope function look like this, but we actually have to double that because there's two zeros each cycle. So you get something like this for the rads per second, but for the cycles per second, it's just the difference of the two. And because we don't know which one is larger, we put absolute values in there. So there you have it. Derivation, very simple. The frequency of beats when you have two closely matched but not quite equal frequencies, it's just the difference of the two. And we'll call it at that point, and then we'll pick up these two topics in class, the Doppler effect and beat frequencies, and then there's still one more we'll consider, which is two-source sound interference.